previously on Little North. Can you believe it? We're about to start a big epic canoe trip. Our journey began with the large windswept lakes of the Cat River watershed. Hey, my the days were long and marked by countless kilometers as we forged ahead upstream. Now we would begin what promised to be the most challenging section of our journey, a crossing of the height of land to reach the storied waters of the Throat River. It is a, another gorgeous morning here on the Cat River. We are starting things off with a 480 meter portage around Pisu Falls. We went up there last night looking for a campsite. Couldn't really find a good campsite. So we paddled back about 500 meters to this spot where we made up a bush camp. When we were looking for a campsite around Pisu Falls, we stumbled across the old portage trail. Now the portage trails up to this point have been pretty good, but now as we're starting to approach the height of land, it's kind of evident that there's less uh, canoe travel or even hunting and fishing travel from the First Nations up to some of these portions up here. So the, the trail at Pisu, it, it's there, but the landing is all obscured by uh, like tag alders and, and whatnot. Hey. Hi. Clearing our way to the boat. <laughs> the good news is the trail beyond there looks pretty good. And two minutes later, you, you now got your trail back, or your landing. I mean, we don't know what's in store for us down the trail, so saws in hand, let's do it. Beautiful, clear trail. We got the silkies out there today and we'll do a bit of clearing just at the landing and then if there's any obstructions on the trail. Hopefully the remainder of that portage today is fairly easy going. We do have a few more portages on the day. We really haven't done much portaging on the trip, but uh, now is when things get interesting. I started feeling a little disheartened and nervous about just how hard this part of the trip was going to be. I have a feeling we're going to be entering into the type 2 fun portion of this trip. I have a feeling it's going to be mostly like this where you can't even see the landing and you go find somewhere else to land and then you accidentally stumble upon the portage maybe like 150 meters up um, but yeah I mean this is it's part of the adventure so I'm excited hopefully there's not too many fallen trees <laughs> So we're tracking and wading our way up river because there's no portage here. And rightly so, it's a class one, so anyone going down is just gonna go down the river here. I mean, this being a historic fur trade route too, it might have made more sense for those coming down. From some of the literature I read, it sounded like they were going up the throat and then down into the cat system. Oh, it's refreshing. You look good. We don't have too much. There's about three or four more of this on the on the river before we uh, get up to the lake. And uh, it's a nice sunny day, thankfully, because it's been cool the last couple days. So thankfully, it's actually quite refreshing to wade through the water right now. Headed west for the first time on our journey, we paddled our way upstream through the tranquil waters of the Kamaganish River. We 
were met with a striking landscape of jack pine, spruce, and weathered rock. The lone obstacles, a handful of quaint rapids and falls, carved their way through the rugged landscape. Travel was easy and spirits were high. Oh, otters. Is that what There's those are? Two otters right there. Yeah, I know. I saw a head pop up. <laughs> One final water course, Quintosh Creek, was all that separated us from Sleep Lake and the height of land. A small ribbon of blue on the map, it seemed unopposing, and we gave its passage little thought as we reveled in the beauty of our present surroundings. So we're going up Quintosh Creek. There's a, supposed to be a 500 meter portage on our left, but it's just area of blowdowns and I walked through it trying to find any semblance of a trail. I could barely find anything, not even signs that someone had been there in the past. The landing here looked like there was uh, one little piece of garbage, uh, really weathered and faded. So that's the only sign that someone had been here before. So now we're gonna try to creek whack up Quintosh Creek. And we're going to get canyoned out up here. It goes through a bit of a slot canyon, so I don't know what we're going to do when we get up that way. It's 5.50. We're about to embark on a bushwhack slog. Not my our idea of uh, late day fun. This is going to be brutal. Oh boy. Okay, just watch your steps through some of these. You might find other ways around that I didn't. This is gonna be shit. Oh my god. Slot Canyon. Wow. And from down there, we could probably get the canoe in the water and then I could line it, but let's get the packs over first. So we gotta come up that somehow. Yeah. Oh man. So by taking the packs up, or at least one of the packs, the boat will potentially move a little easier over this stuff. Friggin' slog and a half. Definitely creek whack with the canoe, but obviously we gotta go back and get it and then come up. Oh man, we're gonna get to our site at like eight. The sunset is like 8.30. <sighs> wow, this is a gorgeous creek though. Lots of rock over there. Quintosh Creek, an unexpected quagmire of blowdowns and slot canyons. We were in the thick of it now. There was no easy way out. Here we go. Nice to die. This was our first real trial. The adjacent forest was near impossible to bushwhack a canoe through. So despite the challenges and dangers of wading up the creek, it was our best option to keep forward momentum. <sighs> our struggles up Quintosh Creek typifies the essence of wilderness tripping in the Little North. Even when the path ahead seems impossible, you find a strength deep within and forge ahead. It is too paddle. Quintosh Creek. Or not paddle. Fooly! What a day. What a couple bunch of days.
That was a two hour tour of Quintosh Creek. And uh, as you can see over top, it looks like we've got some storms coming in. Just like, you know, why not? Throw in some thunderstorms when we're already soaking wet. The day was wearing on. As the heavens erupted and the sun dipped lower on the horizon, it seemed as if the Little North was testing our very worth. If Quintosh Creek was any indication of what the headwaters would contain, then the next few days would undoubtedly test our strongest resolve. It's not a bad looking lake though. made it to the height of land and uh, yeah it was pretty hard to get up here um, Quintosh Creek definitely was tricky having to drag the canoe through that a lot of blowdowns took out uh, the old Portage Trail I, I don't know what tomorrow is gonna bring trying to get over to the Throat River but if it's anything like that it's gonna be tricky so the good news is it, it's only 11 K that we want to go tomorrow we could go even less if we want if we need to but it's going to be a, a long, difficult day of portage, and it seems so. Right now, though, we are at camp. We found a nice little flat spot here on aptly named Sleep Lake, and uh, evening is setting in. Moon is out over there. Just going to get something nice and hot into us and then hit the hay because, yeah, for a day that we actually thought we were going to get here in, in good time, ended up being a bit more of a slog. So that's what uh, Expedition Canoeing is all about. So today we're going to cross the height of land into a small chain of lakes and creeks that lead us into Tinker Lake. And Tinker Lake is basically where the Throat River almost starts. It starts a little further north of Tinker Lake, but beyond that it's just a little narrow winding creek. But beyond Tinker Lake, that's where the majority of flow on the Throat River starts to pick up. Today our goal is to cross the height of land. There's a series of who knows what type of portages in, in store for us. This area has seen a lot of blowdown. We've pretty much allowed all day for us to go 11 kilometers, which is a fraction of what we've been going for the majority of this route thus far. We'll be uh, slogging through the woods. I think once we get to a bog midway through that that should facilitate some easier travel, but it's getting to the bog, which is like 800 meters to a kilometer through potentially thick, dense boreal forest. Uh, that could be the struggle. Well, it looks like a trail, so let's check it out. Oh my god. We thought after yesterday's slog up Quintosh Creek that the 1800 meter portage would be absolutely not a portage. It would just be 1800 meter bushwhack. Not too sure what happened, but we'll take it and we're grateful. There'll probably be some blowdowns as we get further down the trail, but at least we're not starting the trail bushwhacking, so. Oh, man. This is pretty good. I mean, I was really, really thinking we were going to get the bushwhack slog. Some of the old reports I read from people doing the, 
crossing to the throat in the 90s said they had some of the worst bushwhacking they've ever encountered in their life. But going through this trail, which looks like it's been used a lot for many years, it probably is a historic fur trade route. It's hard to imagine crazy bushwhacks. We're also going through a lot of bog area, which in, in the boreal, you have a lot of these sphagnum bogs. They're poor nutrients, high acidity, so not a lot of plant matter grows here. And because of that, you tend not to get a lot of trees around it and they preserve the trail really nicely. Also, the sphagnum makes a nice divot down the middle and it preserves a footpath for a long time. It's very mushy, so it takes almost twice the effort to move because you have to pull your feet constantly out. And uh, in a way, it's probably good we got all of our clothes and boots completely soaked yesterday when we were shoving our canoe up friggin' slaw canyon because now that our feet are completely soaked from also doing this bog, it doesn't feel quite as disheartening. But poor Brad has the canoe over his head, so he's not just sinking a normal amount, he's double sinking. So I imagine he's probably very exhausted. across the height of land and this watershed, all the waters from here flow into Lake Winnipeg. So now we're going downstream, thankfully. And uh, yeah, we're getting a lot of rain today. So maybe that means the uh, water levels in the creek will be up a little bit too. So pretty happy that that portage was there. I mean, we got to give thanks to the First Nations trappers who uh, kept that portage alive and uh, keeping it passage for recreational canoeists like ourselves. So, uh, onward, downstream now. There is about four sets of what I've marked on the map as class ones. And as you can see, it's pretty much just little riffles and boulders. It's August, so it's low water. We're portaging in stream for the most part or lining and waiting. It's not too difficult. Most of these sets are really, um, really short, thankfully. So I think we've got a stretch of about a kilometer of potential open water uh, creek travel before we get to another few little sets like this but yeah it just slows you down a little bit but it's honestly not too too bad say we're going downstream now so that's awesome <laughs> we slowly made our way down the inky black waters of the headwater stream there was barely enough water to float our canoe and the hours melted away as the meters drifted on by we got tailwind though as we neared the junction with Tinker Lake, a stiff wind whipped up, and a dark wall of clouds marched steadily over the horizon. I don't know, they're getting bigger out here. Yeah, here's a big one. Oh yeah. I think the waves are changing a bit here, so when it gets calm, I'm gonna tack and then I will go down to that far shore. Okay. And then we'll work our way down that far shore by tacking in and out a couple times. Calm stretch, tack. Okay, now up. Now 
ride them in. Down to those like big boulders. And then uh, as we get closer, we'll tack again. Just get ready to catch any wave that's gonna surf with you, okay? Like that one. And there's another one. So we're trying something new this trip. These are black bean burgers and it was freeze dried, a giant pack we bought. It calls for one cup of water and then you let them hydrate and then we can bake them or grill them over the fire rather. So we're gonna check it out. Okay, this is really interesting. Ta-da! This will be interesting. Burgers after a week of camping. It's a new concept to us, so we'll see how these work out. Tastes better than uh, meat burgers. <laughs> Maybe because you've been out here for a week. Maybe. <laughs> they do taste good though. Uh, they taste amazing. Like, I, again, I would make these at home. It'd be nice to enjoy the site and do some fishing and stuff. We got here in a decent time too, but the wind is just howling across the lake. It's crazy windy and rainy out there. Temperatures dropped a lot too. <laughs> and uh, I don't think it's supposed to let up for a while either. So yeah, we'll see. Tomorrow we're going down the Throat River proper now. It's all downhill from here, but um, with this cold, wet weather and this windy weather, we'll see about getting down there, but uh, yeah. Ready to finally hit the throat though? Yeah. I don't want to make it to White Law. Where we can have a rest day. <laughs> In the sun. Today we're actually going to be heading down the Throat River proper for the first time on our trip. I mean, this was the big goal of our trip is to find a way over to the throat, retrace this fur trade route in the process, and then work our way down river. Optimistic, excited. I mean, it is cool, it's damp. It's kind of been cool, damp, and rainy for the majority of our trip. Woo! Throat river, baby. Feels good, doesn't it? It's like all this time we were anticipating the slog to get here and you know the big lake travel and now we make it to this this river that we're gonna take down from its from basically its start to its finish. It's pretty cool. A little bit of low water here on the headwaters of the throat but uh, kind of expected this late in the season. Also when you're taking the upper branches of a river, not in the springtime. It's our first rapid of the day and it's just way too bouldery to go down. And we have probably about two kilometers of this, so it's gonna be a very slow start to the day, but that's the Throat River. So I'm sure it'll be worth it once we get down. And there 
is our next one that we have to do in 50 feet. There's enough flow that we can line the canoe out without really gouging the gel coat or anything like that. It's kind of just rolling over these rocks. A few more streams will be flowing into the river in the next couple kilometers, so hopefully it's going to pick up some volume as we work our way down river here. Pulling the stern over? Yeah. Not bad though, the last 2k has been taking us probably 45 minutes, so we're probably averaging around two and a half kilometers an hour. Log jams down the upper throat. Still on some of the bigger ones out of the way. Keeping these nice rollers on the bottom here so that we can get over the canoe and just kind of bump it over, pull it over, slowly make our way down river. Man, you know I said that we were going like 2.5 kilometers an hour? Little white lie. We just got slowed right down. I think we're going about one kilometer an hour. I mean, the throat's gonna be challenging at any time of the year for you. However, we're making her. I knew it was gonna be a hard day. Man, today's been a grind. Wading, lining through small streams, log jams, going through bushwhack portages, cutting some trails to get the canoe through, finding traces of the old portages, uh, doing a bit to re-clear some sections just so we can move through. You may be hearing him grunting, but Brad's balance and his ability portage to literally any bush is beyond me he can balance on like his pinky toe with 120 pounds on his back and over his head without the use of his hands for balance and can make it up a hill like he must have been a ballerina in a previous life or something i'm not too sure i did ballet for 13 years and like i have nothing on him so he could be a principal lead and like the nutcracker if it was like bush crashing version or something. Thankfully some of the boreal is nice and open but there's lots of blowdowns and stuff throughout there too that can make travel pretty tricky at times but our average speed of the day so far is a blistering 2.2 kilometers uh, an hour. <laughs> Um, and the only reason we've gone a little faster is some of these smoother sections that have now punctuated some of these little falls and boulder guards. Paint in the throat river with the color of yellow. Follow the yellow rock river. I will say this river is pretty though. Yeah. So if my map is right, i.e. if I marked it up correctly, we should be approaching about a five kilometer stretch of oxbows and meandering section of the river where there's no obstacles besides maybe a beaver dam or whatnot. So fingers crossed, that's where we're at. But we'll see. It'd be nice to have some paddling for a while actually instead of slogging, we're pretty zonked. The headwaters were everything we had imagined them to be. Remote, challenging, forgotten, and lost to the ravages of time. With only faint traces hinting at former use, 
it was almost unfathomable to think that others had traveled through here before. The lands of the Little North are in a constant state of natural change, and the footsteps of history are slowly devoured by the encroaching forest. Our time is only fleeting, but the rhythms of the Little North remain. Sun is starting to go down, but we made it and we are gonna stay on this lake for two nights. Well-deserved rest day. Now we just gotta find a spot to stay at, so. Awesome, super stoked. <laughs> this is the best moment ever. Let's go get a campsite before we lose sun. <laughs> beginning of the headwaters where it was just like go 100 meters then drag the canoe over boulders for 800 and then go 100 meters and then drag it for another 500 which felt like forever and it was forever um, realizing that it does come to an end at the end and that you're always rewarded with a really amazing sight and it's always 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 worth it so So it's rest day, got lots of time on our hands, and I brought lots of stuff to bake with. Just because it's a longer trip too, it takes up a little less uh, space, and nothing tastes better than fresh baked goods out here in the backcountry. So today I'm gonna try to make some apple cinnamon biscuits here. So I have some Bisquick here, I got two cups. I've got dehydrated milk, and for this ratio I'm doing about two thirds cup dehydrated milk to two cups of Bisquick. We'll whisk this up. So we'll add this to our Bisquick here. I'm gonna add some pre-mixed cinnamon, spice, allspice here that we made up at home. Add a bit of white sugar as well. I also dehydrated apple slices. I'm just gonna break these up, chunk them into here. Now I'm gonna lightly grease a pan. In this case, just a little pie plate here. Got some oil. Evenly coated and the edges too, so that it doesn't burn. It'll be like a apple loaf. Yeah. So I'm gonna cook it on the reflector oven here. Uh, I've got this nice rock wall built on the other side of the fire. It's already throwing a lot of heat off on me. With the reflector oven, it's gonna catch all that heat. It's gonna reflect it right down into our dish. So we also have some honey powder. Basically, it's a one-to-one -one ratio of water to honey, and then you boil it afterwards to get a nice liquid honey.
the honey is like soaked in to the top of it so it's like a really moist almost tastes like an apple fritter it's uh, pretty amazing chef Brad has struck again or baker Brad does this all the time it's really good Put him back. I'm trying to go for a walleye right now. Not bad though. See, you, buddy. While the fishing was unfortunately lackluster, the rest day was a welcomed reprieve from our journey over the height of land and across the headwaters. The strain of the past week had taken a noticeable toll on our bodies, and we relished the relaxing change in pace. Well rested, we were eager to continue our journey and paddle the waters that lay beyond. The remainder of the throat promised a new set of challenges and rewards as we ventured down its course to its confluence with the Barrens River. on the next episode of Little North. As we continue our journey down the Throat River, the narrow headwater streams give way to wide swaths of fast moving water. The Throat still has plenty of challenges and surprises in store for us, and our struggles are far from over. We've only got one canoe. We've got 150 more kilometers to go. I don't want to risk anything stupid for a bit of adrenaline. So we definitely smashed into a huge rock on one of these rapids. The river broadens as we descend its turbulent waters through the rushing rapids and cascading waterfalls. Hardship, triumph, and adventure await as we continue our journey across the Little North.